Hello. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. This is the penultimate event of, of uh, Muswell Hill Sustainability Group's Green Open Homes program. Um, we've been running the program for 10 years now. This is the 10th year. And I wanted to read to you a short quote which I think is quite good at uh, summing up why we're doing this um, and what the thinking is behind the green open homes. It's a quote from Howard Zinn. I've got to take my glasses off at this stage. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents, and to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. So what I'd like to do is to uh, introduce Casper Bradshaw and thank him very much indeed for giving up his time to talk to us this evening. I have uh, a personal professional connection with Casper in that he was responsible for helping me put a solar thermal system on my own house and he did a great job. Since then his name keeps cropping up with uh, the warmest references you could imagine from architects that we uh, have connections with who are very knowledgeable about eco-building and particularly eco-retrofit. Um, and he's going to talk to us this evening about solar thermal, solar PV, and heat pumps. And I think he's going to squeeze in a little reference to temperature compensated control systems. Um, so I will uh, hand over, and I think you can use that mic. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, everybody, for having me today. It's great to be here um, with the uh, Muswell Hill Sustainability Group. Uh, so my name is Casper, and um, just a little bit of introduction about me. I went to Scotland to university to study renewable energy uh, with a focus on mechanical engineering. I learned a lot about wind turbines. Um, I was able to go to Germany for a year as part of the Erasmus program, which is no longer, sadly, uh, operating. And I learned a lot in Germany about renewable energy, about solar panels. And when I came back from there, I then worked in London uh, installing solar panels with a local company here. So I actually got some experience on the roof, using tools, doing plumbing work. And um, from there, I then went to another company called Inhabit, where I worked for five years organizing uh, this kind of work, the kind of services installation of solar systems and um, heat pumps and also MVHR uh, ventilation. And then in the last two years, I've been running my own company, Next Step Heating, doing uh, the same sort of thing as well. So um, I've had the, the fortunate um, luck to be able to work in the field that I studied. You know, it's quite unusual that you can actually study something you're really passionate about and then actually day to day do that as well. So um, it's been an amazingly, um, you know, enjoyable uh, kind of period of time. And I've also had the opportunity as well to do a lot of experimentation. So I've been able to work on projects that are pushing the boundaries, trying different things out, and I've learned a lot through that. Um, one thing that I really brought me to work in this field of the domestic sector renewables is that the projects are quite short. They're quite a short space of time in terms of the involvement with the engineering kind of side. And what that means is compared to, for example, a hydroelectric dam, which takes 10 years to build, the short projects mean that you learn a lot. You make mistakes and you learn from them. And very quickly, you can actually have quite a lot of experience because you've done some, you've seen what happens, and you've been able to keep improving. So that's something that I do like about um, you know, in being in the domestic sector. So today we're going to talk a little bit about renewables, about heat pumps. 
Heat pumps are for domestic construction industry quite a relatively new development. And all of this new development links back to the changes we've had with renewable energy generation, which is wind turbines. We have had a huge growth in, the, in wind turbine production. We'll talk about that later. And so because they're relatively new on the scene, there's obviously lots of questions. There's lots of... Um, uh, there's quite a lack of knowledge generally in, in the kind of people you'd normally rely on. Normally you rely on your plumber to tell you the best thing to do for your house in terms of heating, in terms of hot water. And now with this, as there are less plumbers that are experienced, it becomes more difficult to get good advice. You know, sometimes you feel like maybe they're telling me to keep a gas boiler because that's all they're confident, that's all they know about. So sometimes it can be sadly now a bit more difficult. But... Um, the number of people is growing who are able to, to work with heat pumps, so hopefully it is getting easier to, to get good advice. So um, let's jump into the presentation. Um, these are some of the things that we can look at. So the first thing is, how does the heat pump work? A little bit of physics. So basically the heat pump is moving heat, essentially. So it's using something called the refrigeration cycle. If we go to the next one. Uh, and the refrigeration cycle is quite clever, it's kind of physics-based, and it all comes to this thing called the refrigerant. So the refrigerant is basically a gas that uh, melts at very low temperatures. So at minus degrees, it can, it can undergo a phase change from gas to liquid. Um, normally we think of water boiling at 100 degrees, but this uh, refrigerant can actually boil at minus temperatures, very, very low temperatures. So what we can do is we can force that refrigerant around a mechanical um, circuit and we can make it expand into gas and then contract back into liquid. And as it does those phase changes, it either releases lots of energy or absorbs lots of energy. So you take that change and you put it into a mechanical system, either one that's got a, a heat exchanger with lots of air blowing through or a wet heat exchanger, and you have your heat pump. And the good thing about this system is the electricity that it uses from in the compressor to actually drive the gas around the system is a lot less energy than the amount of heat that we can transfer from one place to another place. And typically we talk about roughly 300% efficiency. So you can, um, compared to a direct electric radiator, you can have a lot more heat um, compared to how much electricity you use to run the system. So that's kind of the basic uh, reason why heat pumps are a preferable um, heating system in, in, um, in these kind of situations. And um, the, big, um, the big change that we've had is this all this thing going back to the grid. The reason why heat pumps are now um, being funded by the government, you're talking uh, recently, it's, the funding has gone up from £5,000 to £7,500 funding, so it's quite significant. So you have to ask yourself, what is the background to this? Why is the government so keen to push heat pumps? For 50 years, we've been using gas boilers. How, why now is the heat pump so you know, uh, popular? Because heat pumps are not a new technology. They've been around for 50 years. We've had heat pumps just as long as we've had gas boilers. So why are they now becoming so popular? And it all goes back to the um, increase in generation in the grid. So if you look at this graph here, what you can see is the coal is an orange. So the coal generation in the UK has really tapered down over the last 20 years. And you can see um, the, the, the flip side of that is the dark brown on the bottom is actually bioenergy. And slightly debatable here, some of the coal stations have literally just switched over to biomass and are still relatively polluting. Um, it's quite a controversial thing at the moment. What they did is the UK actually made up some of the criteria for biomass and made it look very green to begin with. But now we're having to review that and go back and say, actually, is it that green to be importing wood en masse from Canada, from Russia, to use in what used to be an enormous coal fire station where there isn't local heat being utilised, it's just for electricity. So that's, that's obviously a little bit of a cash, uh, more controversial side. But the, the positive side is the light blue there, which is the huge growth in wind generation. And that's about um, gone from being 2% um, 
to 20% 2018, and during lockdown, we even had 50% of electricity was coming from wind, wind power in the UK. So it, during lockdown, our electricity consumption went down, and we were really using a lot of uh, wind energy. So the UK also, in Europe, is one of the few countries that actually has the most capacity to increase even more its wind generation because of the amount of coastline we have in the UK. We've got so much coastline that we could actually be exporting wind power back to uh, the continent and to the other countries where we've got um, power lines connected to. So there's much more potential going forward for us to have even more renewable energy generation. Um, so because of this change, this is what's changed the numbers on what's the most efficient way to uh, use energy for heating. And um, if we go back to this one here, we're looking at the efficiency of different types of systems. So when you make electricity, if you're using coal, you've got to transport the electricity from the power station to the house. There are losses everywhere. But as that coal is being replaced by wind power, the carbon, the carbon um, concentration of the grid electricity comes down and using electricity becomes greener. And it's got to the point now where using electricity is, direct electricity is about the same carbon um, energy, operational energy use as using gas. And so if we use the heat pump as well, uh, and the refrigeration um, efficiency, we get to even bigger carbon savings. So the, 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 back to the first question again, why they're so popular, is because nearly every model that's been made from climate predictions going forward, how we're going to uh, reduce our carbon emissions, they all rely on changing over to heat pumps. Heat pumps are a really big part of the strategic uh, models that have been made for reducing our carbon emissions. So that's the background to the heat pumps. Um, but the reality is uh, that there are some, obviously some limitations and some challenges with doing that in practice. It's all well and good having the theory, but how do we then go and do it, particularly in London? So the first challenge is this graph, which I find very interesting. And at the bottom, in white, is our current electricity usage. And the red is if we took all of our heating energy in the UK and we just switched it straight to electric heating. So if everybody just bought cheap fan heaters from the shop and just heated their houses with electric radiators, how much electricity would we need? And you can see that between the white, uh, small little lines at the bottom and the red, is an enormous increase in energy would be needed if we just straight away, everyone just started using electric electricity. And the, um, the blue line further down is a combination of heat pumps and also some energy storage. So you can see that with the heat pumps, we can significantly reduce that burden from the grid of how much electricity we need to draw because the grid obviously has a limited amount of electricity that can travel across the country. Um, the grid was made during, um, after the war, and that was a huge investment. It took a lot of money to build it in the first place. Increasing it to twice the capacity, three times the capacity, is again a huge infrastructure challenge. So anything we can do to reduce that burden on the grid is um, going to be a much more sustainable way to actually get to the goals we need to get to. And it's very important as well to say that because of this, what this graph illustrates is we'll only really get to a um, net zero or a low energy uh, economy in the UK if we also consider a fabric first approach, which is insulation, which is reducing energy use to begin with. So if we have a building that's got single glazed windows, that's got solid brick walls and no insulation, those are the things we should be thinking about first. Are there ways we can add insulation, the ways we can change the windows, the air leakages, all of those aspects, um, we need to take that into account to, uh, on, on a kind of national strategic level to be able to realistically be able to heat our, our, all our homes using electricity. So if we look at heat pumps, um, it is a very confusing area because it's quite versatile, the heat pump technology, the, the refrigeration cycle, it's quite versatile. We can do different things with it. So traditionally, what we've seen a lot of heat pumps being used for is what we call air conditioning, AC systems. So you've got here on the right-hand side, AC systems. Now, typically used to provide space heating or space cooling. 
because only the air conditioning system is actually able to give you cooling because with cooling you need to have cold air being blown around to quickly make people feel cool. So that is how we know really heat pumps in the UK is through air-to-air -air systems. They're called air-to-air -air because it's taking energy from the air outside and then it's delivering that energy again via the air. So the medium of heat transfer is both in the air-to-air. With the heat pumps that we're mainly talking about and the government is actually subsidising, it's called air to water. So the heat exchange on the outside is with a heat exchange with fins and a fan blowing air through it. And on the inside, we're using a central wet heating system that could be radiators, could be underfloor heating, and it can also heat a hot water tank, a stored hot water tank, again with wet loops that go inside to heat it up. So, very similar terms here, air to water, air to air, and yet it's got very big implications in the actual industry. The air to air is our air conditioning units, uh, no government funding for them. The efficiency of the two systems is very similar. They're both very efficient, they're both very good ways of reducing energy use. If you've got, like for example, this building here, if we had previously electric heating, we wanted to quickly make it less energy efficient, it might be cheaper to put air conditioning than to install lots of radiators and an air-to-water heat pump because of the level of infrastructure pipework that would be needed for an air-to-water system compared to the air-to-air. -air. So air-to-air -air can have some very good um, uh, applications. The issue for the government is that because people use it for cooling, they don't want to subsidise cooling. They don't want to subsidise people who actually just have it for comfort cooling, which is an increase in your energy consumption to do comfort cooling. Um, and you can see there, there's some pictures there of the, the different heat emitters. So different types of heat pump. We talked obviously about the kind of air source heat pump, using the air as a source, but there are different ones as well. We've got the uh, closed loop lake collector. So there are some heat pumps that actually get the heat from the Thames River. There are some installed upstream some in Oxford, some in the upper levels of the Thames that have pipes that go into the Thames and they actually make the water a little bit cooler and use that to heat their homes. Now, there's some implications on that. One is impact on the environment, impact on aquatic life. You have to have some surveys to assess their level of water flow, what impact would that have on the water temperature. There are some buildings, historic buildings that, are, um, that you see that have uh, the similar thing as well, air, air to water, um, heat pumps. And the good thing about the water is it doesn't get as cold in the winter. So the issue with the air to air system is in the winter, the air drops to quite a low temperature. Water and the ground doesn't get that cold. The ground only gets to about 12 degrees minimum, about a metre depth below the ground, it only gets to about 12 degrees. So it's much warmer than the ambient air temperature. And, um, that's another one people are familiar with, the, the ground source heat pump. That one needs the closed bore loop, uh, is one example, where you have a bore hole that's very, very deep. Um, to use it in London is very expensive. You're talking about £20,000 extra cost minimum just for the boreholes. So looking at kind of that kind of system, it's a very big, and the saving you'll get from that rarely eats into that initial cost. Doing ground source heat pump systems, you've got to look at uh, a survey of the uh, underground infrastructure, drainage, services. In some cases, even people have drilled into the train uh, underground tunnelling, putting in ground source heat pump. It's actually happened, there's photos of it. Um, and the other thing also, you've got to look for unexploded bombs. There's a survey in London of where unexploded bombs may be, because um, from World War II, that's another thing that's uh, of concern. And there's also actually secret tunnels under the London, used by MI5, that we don't publicly know about, but you can gain, you can have a rough idea. When you see access points that are not labelled for any purpose, that again is an indication that they may be used by MI5. So there's, there's a lot of things to look into for people doing this ground source. And there are some people who do it. More commonly it's done outskirts of London, where you've got a large field, a large patch of earth. It needs to be at least about an acre size, so talking about a big amount of land where you can basically dig up the whole thing with a tractor and lay coils of pipe in the ground, which is much cheaper to do than the borehole system, and um, gives you much better efficiency, it's talking more like 400% efficiency compared to the air source system. So um, 
that's good. We've got another one here, solar assisted heat pump. That solar assisted heat pump is a bit more niche. And the way to think of it is it's very similar to solar thermal. It's almost the same application as solar thermal systems. So with a solar assisted heat pump, you've got um, a panel on the roof with refrigerant pipes inside. When the sun shines on that refrigerant panel and the heat pump starts working, you get very high efficiencies, 800, 900% efficiency, because there's so much sun energy going onto that panel. When the sun doesn't shine, it's pretty much useless because using a panel is not an effective way to, when there's no sunshine, is not an effective way to move heat around. You really need air, you need an air exchanger to move a lot of energy at, when, there's, when there's smaller temperature differences. So the solar assisted system is typically in addition to another backup heating system used generally just to sub subsidize um, hot water because hot water is something you need in the summer. Summer and sunshine go together well. So a bit of background on that one. You've got the exhaust air heat pump. So the exhaust air heat pump is a bit of a compromise. And it works with something, the uh, ventilation system. So you might have a house, a whole house ventilation system. It's bringing air in from outside, into the bedrooms, into the living room. It's taking air from the bathrooms and the kitchen back outside. And with the exhaust air heat pump, we use that airflow of cold air from the heat exchanger to outside. We use that to make it even colder and then provide some additional heat. It can either be to heat a hot water tank, give some hot water heating, or it can be a little bit of air transferred heat, space heating. The problem with the exhaust air heat pumps is that an MVHR system, this ventilation system, works at about maximum half an air change an hour, maybe generally more like a, a third um, air changes per hour, so quite a low level of, of air flow rate. In order to move heat for the uh, air source heat pump, you're talking about eight to ten times higher flow rates. So you need a lot of airflow to really move a meaningful amount of heat to really do something with. And this is the reason why the exhaust air heat pump is a more of a compromise. If you haven't got somewhere to put an outside heat pump system, then if it's like a block of flats, something like that, or it's a building that hasn't got any space, then that can be a, an efficient way to provide hot water heating as well as uh, the, the ventilation. But it's interesting to know about these other things because you hear lots of names, you hear lots of brands. The brands always come out with amazing efficiency, like the Solar Assisted came up with some amazing efficiency kind of claims, and then it took them to actually go and be tested uh, independently for those claims to be a little bit kind of brought down to reality. So. Um, I think it's always good to have a bit of a basic understanding what some of these other things are. I haven't talked about the gas heat pump. The gas heat pump is, um, is much lower scale uh, in what you might see. Sometimes you have, for camper vans, you have a fridge, a gas heat pump fridge, where you put gas inside, it burns the gas, and it uses that to power the fridge. So um, on a domestic scale, generally, it's a much smaller, smaller thing that you might see with that. So that's more about the exhaust air heat pump. So what are the efficiencies with the heat pump system? What do we want to think about when we're thinking about doing heat pumps? So um, you've got the kind of outside unit. Um, you want that to be somewhere where there's good airflow. So sometimes people think, let me hide it away. I don't want to see it. It's a very big piece of equipment. Let's put it in a kind of hidden away courtyard space so I won't see. The problem is, if it's hidden away, there won't be also any airflow to it. Um, one thing about the, the air source heat pump is it's producing cold air because we're providing heating inside the building and cold air doesn't rise up like, like hot air does and it won't naturally want to go away. It will just want to stay exactly where it is. So, for example, if you put a heat pump down where the, um, the, the, the drums are over here and it was blowing against the wall over there, that whole area would have a little microclimate. It would be maybe four, five, six, seven, eight degrees colder than the rest of the room and the heat pump would be working much less efficiently and it might break every year because of working at such cold temperatures. Um, so it's something to be avoided. You want it to be somewhere where as the heat pump blows air away from it, that air will then be taken away and will get new air into the back of the heat pump. So that's always something to kind of bear in mind. Something I, I explain to people as well is if you think about the volume of the house, the volume of a whole house, you're trying to heat all of that air up inside that house, that's kind of the amount of air you've got to think of passing through a heat pump and then getting away from the heat pump. 
So you want to have it in somewhere that has, generally we recommend to have it in a garden, somewhere where it's, where it's exposed. Sometimes in the front of the front garden as well, it can work. Sometimes, depending on how big the front garden is. Um, then we've got some other things as well. So we've got um, different types of heating, underfloor heating. Um, what time is it? Eight o'clock. Um, so, yeah, with a heat pump, it's, it's got limitations. We talked about one limitation just now about the electricity grid. So one big question is, why can't we just... You know, for every place where there's a gas boiler, why can't we just take them all out and just put heat pumps everywhere? Like, what's the problem? Why can't we just do that? Because we know that heat pumps are very efficient. We know that the running costs are similar to gas boilers. So apart from what we just talked about earlier, what are the other reasons? So one of the things is that the actual power consumption of that heat pump. So you can just keep buying heat pumps and keep making the bigger and bigger three-phase heat pump. You can go up quite high power usage. You can apply to the uh, network operator, say, put me a new cable in just for my heat pump. Um, but it becomes very expensive. So the key thing then that you get to with heat pumps is, well, how much heat do you really actually need? Because if you don't need that much heat, there's no point paying thousands and thousands for this enormous heat pump system that actually doesn't need to be so enormous. And so with the heat pump system, because we're also trying to do the fabric upgrades as well, we're trying to insulate the building as well, reduce the energy loss, we can heat it something that's called continuous heating. So you've got something called intermittent heating and continuous. So with intermittent heating, you might say, like this hall, for example, let's just let the hall completely cool down, we won't do any heating in here, and then when we come back tomorrow at the same time, 9 o'clock, maybe a couple of hours before, we'll just heat the hall up again. And that works okay for buildings that you're not using most of the time. But with a house, if you're there for quite long periods of time, particularly if it's well insulated, it can be much more efficient to let it stay closer to your target temperature. And the reason, if you do that as well, you don't need as much power to keep it at that temperature. You can reduce how much power you need because you're always topping up and keeping it closer to your target temperature. So an important part of this is the calculations. That's what this kind of picture here is, the calculations. How big are the walls, how big are the floors, the windows? And previously to this being a thing, uh, plumbers never had to do many calculations because with a gas boiler, from the default, you have a huge oversizing potential. With a gas boiler, it's hard to make it small. It's hard to actually give someone a gas boiler with a low heat output because when you burn gas, straight away you release loads of energy. Gas is an amazing, I mean, it's taken millions of years to create gas under the ground, you know, centuries long uh, processes. So once you take that energy and you release it, actually it's loads of energy. So some of the boilers, um, Wiesman and, and Valent, some of them with uh, the, the, the modulation, they have a gas valve modulation and it can actually close the gas valve to stop the gas coming in. So it has a little bit of gas coming in and they can take down the heat output quite low. But that's quite an expensive part of those gas boilers and the cheaper gas boilers don't have as much regulation of the gas valve and they can't go as low. So what that means is when the gas engineers come along they say well how big's the house? Let's do 24 kilowatts. Let's do 32 kilowatts. Let's do 40 kilowatts. And the difference in price between those different ratings is maybe just 200 pounds difference. So it's a little value. With the heat pump every three kilowatts of extra output is about a thousand pounds. So it's significant. So the calculations suddenly become really important. And that's why you need to then kind of have a good survey, a proper measurement, and you need to also be thinking about insulation. What's the actual um, the heat loss through that medium? And what we find is, with things like wall insulation, for example, the first bit of insulation makes quite an enormous difference. So an uninsulated solid brick wall may have a U value of two, maybe one and a half to two, a solid brick wall. If you add just 20 mil, 50 mil of insulation, you can bring that down to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which is half, if not a third of that heat loss, which is quite a, a, a small amount of insulation. So the, the, the impact of adding insulation is significant to the, the implication of the design for the heating system, for how big the heat pump needs to be, how big the radiators need to be, um, whether you're going to get the house warm enough or not. 
the, the pipe work that has to carry that heat around the house. So um, that's obviously a big part of, of doing the calculations. We've got underfloor heating. Underfloor heating is good with heat pumps because it works at a low temperature. The floor, with a wooden floor, you don't want it to go above 27 degrees if you've got a wooden finish. Because if timber floor goes above 27 degrees, it begins to warp, it begins to change shape. And if you see like some of these old floors, the tongue and groove floors, not tongue and groove, sorry, the um, parquet floors that have like herringbone styles on them, if they start to get too dry, they can literally lift up and you've got a completely uneven surface. And that can happen with any wooden floor. It can start to deform and change shape if it gets too dry, if the surface is too hot and it gets too dry. So because of that, underfloor heating wants to be at a low temperature. And low temperatures are great for heat pump efficiency. On the downside with underfloor is they take a long time to respond. So if you switch, if this church had underfloor heating now, and it was cold and we switched it on, it might be two or three hours before it actually started to get warm and you started to feel it. In this church, we've also got carpet on the floor, which is an insulator. So when people put carpet and underfloor heating, they're actually, the carpet's actually stopping the heat from getting out and uh, means it has to work even hotter to give the same heat output. So underfloor heating can be great, but it can also, compared to radiators, it can also need more energy because it has to switch on earlier and it has, to, um, it has to stay on, it has to be on for longer. So depending obviously on the, on the house, depending on the way, some people like to live always in a really warm house, other people don't mind putting on a jumper and, and slippers and being in cold attached houses and have it on. People have got different kind of habits with heating and uh, underfloor heating is not one that you can switch on and off. It's not one that you can control in that kind of way. You've got to leave it for much longer time periods. Um, but another good thing about it is that it's all plastic in underfloor. It's all plastic pipe, and plastic pipe doesn't corrode like radiators do. So you don't get that gradual degradation. So with radiators, as they get older, you get more and more metal filings in the pipe, like everything gets a bit more rusty and needs replacement. So um, these are some little graphs showing you efficiency. So... Um, what this one over here on the right-hand side shows is that when it gets warm outside, the heat pump is more efficient, but sadly in the summer when it's most efficient, we don't need any heating. So um, that's a bit of an inherent um, reality with this, these systems. Um, and that's why we always talk about the seasonal coefficient of performance. We're always looking at how does it behave over the whole year as a whole, not just taking one day here or there, not just comparing. And when you look at the data sheets sometimes and you see amazingly high figures, that's because that figure is taken at some specific operating um, parameter that's great. If you look at the average whole year, you then start to get much more realistic efficiency levels. So this is something just about kind of customer uh, awareness when you're looking at different things. When people come to sales, people tell you these amazing efficiencies, just got to bear in mind that is that actually seasonal is that looking at the entire heating season um, but the good news is that heat pumps uh, still work really efficiently in the winter and still give you a good efficiency that gives you good you know comparatively good running cost compared to a gas boiler so it is an alternative that we can consider even with um, this <clears throat> so um, how much space do we need for heat pumps so on the inside um, compared to a combi boiler, it definitely needs a lot more space. So this is a bit of a, another limitation. Buildings that have got lots of combi boilers might not be able to all have heat pumps because they might not have the space in the way that they're laid out for a retrofit an existing property. Obviously, if it's a new property, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but with a heat pump, we need to have a tank. We need to have a hot water tank because unlike a gas boiler, the heat pump cannot bring water from cold all the way up to shower temperature in one fell swoop. It needs multiple goes, it needs to keep uh, running and gradually bringing it up. And that's why we need to have the hot water tank. And then as well as the hot water tank, there's a few other things as well, technical things, like the buffer tank. So the buffer tank is all about giving us enough volume for something called defrost. So in the winter, when it's really cold outside and when it's wet as well, we start to get frost over the back of the heat pump. So you can see there's a picture there with snowy heat pump in the snow. 
On the back of the heat pump, you've got these fins. They can literally get completely iced over, a bit like in your freezer when you leave it for a long time, try to get all the frost out. You can have like a coating of frost in the freezer. You get exactly that coating of frost at the back of the heat pump. So what it does is it's quite clever. When it sees that it's not getting enough airflow, it switches um, direction. And it takes heat from the house and quickly um, uh, evaporates off all of the steam. And you get a big walloping of uh, steam coming off the heat pump, psh, like that. And it's completely clear again and it can carry on working. But in order to do that, it needs somewhere to take that heat from. Now, we don't want to make the house cold, because the whole point is to heat the house. We don't want to make the, the water cold for showering, because the whole point is to give us hot water for showering. So we have our own dedicated minimum volume that we can always take some heat from that. We can make that a little bit cooler to give us this capability to do the defrost. That's like the technical reason for these buffer vessels. So because of these extra vessels, it means we do need a bit more space. We need a bigger kind of cupboard. We need basically a, a, a reasonable cupboard size for some of this equipment. And some of the technical things here, um, sometimes you might want to do this as well, which is basically, um, this is quite technical, but it may be a bit interesting. Heat pumps have to always be able to work at relatively high flow rates with the pump. The pump, similar to gas boilers, some of them, but even more the case, it needs to be able to get water to flow through the heat pump. Because what you've got is a compressor that basically doesn't really want to change too much. Once a compressor is working, it doesn't want to overheat. If the heat pumps overheat, it's not good for them. So we need to have a steady flow of water all the way through them to be able to work smoothly. And sometimes when you've got modern systems like radiators, we have TRVs everywhere. It's building regulations to have TRVs, temperature uh, regulating valves, which basically will close the radiator when the room is warm enough so we don't overheat rooms. We don't want to overheat, unnecessarily overheat a room. We want to be able to set it as hot as you want and then stop using energy to that room when it's enough. And that's what the TRVs can do with the radiator system. But the problem is, if all the TRVs close, then there's less water going through the system. Same for underfloor heating. If you've got lots of rooms and it's a well-insulated house and they're all warm enough, they all switch off, and then there'll only be maybe one little room that's somewhere at the top of the house that's got very little insulation or something like that that keeps running and that will need some flow rate still but not very much a small amount of flow so if we just let the heat pump only go through those loops it would not have enough flow rate so one way to do is this low loss header where you basically allow um, separate pumps to pump through this buffer vessel and it means that one can work at a high speed and one can work at a low speed and they don't have any problems between each other so, again, it's technical, but it's interesting where the heat pump is set up. How much space do we need for a heat pump? So that's a little example of a, a single fan heat pump um, with, with some of the space we need around the heat pump. So an important thing for us to bear in mind in London is planning permission. Okay? And there's some really key, quirky things about the planning permission that is quite, is quite important to know if you're going to do anything with heat pumps. So one of them is one metre. So to be permitted development, to be allowed to put a heat pump in without going to planning, it has to be a metre away from the boundary to your neighbour. And that's an old planning thing that comes from fire spread between buildings. You, if there's a fire in one building, you don't want to be the fire in another adjacent building. So you don't want anything that might catch fire. A heat pump can definitely catch fire if there is a fire. It's got flammable gas inside. So that's... If it's within a metre, then it needs planning permission. The sad reality is that in London, the size of all the buildings in London, the best place to put it is normally always within a metre of the boundary. Because you don't want to go... If you've got a small garden, you don't want to put the heat pump right, right in the middle of the garden. You want to put it on the edge, logically. Same in the front garden. So, sadly, in many cases, it makes most sense, practical sense, to actually put it in the boundary and apply for planning. Another one of these planning conditions is... Uh, the volume of the heat pump. So 0 0.6 metre cubed is the threshold, uh, which smaller than that is permitted development, and bigger needs planning permission. And what you can see here is a single fan. It's a heat pump with just one fan, one fan blowing air. If you've got a double unit that's got two fans, 
that goes above that threshold. That needs planning permission. So any big heat pumps always need planning. Uh, need to apply for planning. The other um, limitation as well is um, what was the other one I was going to say? Um, cooling and the number of heat pumps. You're only put, allowed to put one heat pump under permitted development. So if you've got two, if you've got one and an air conditioning unit, then technically that needs planning. Anything that's going to do cooling needs planning. So if you go to planning, what's the danger? So you've got to pay a bit of money, you've got to do some drawings to show where the heat pump's going to go. That's relatively easy. Um, will they allow you or not? Generally, if it's in the back garden, they never mind. Because basically the back garden is your private space. Generally, people can't see into it, so they don't really care what's going on there. Um, with a conservation area, the specific rule is it can't be visible from a road. So if you can see it from a road, then it's more unlikely whether it's going to pass the planning. But with the heat pumps also, what we can do is we can put them in an enclosure. So we can put timber around them in like a louvered profile that lets the air blow through, but you can't see through. So often in front gardens, people have a bin store, they might have uh, a bike shed, that's maybe a timber, and then you might also put a heat pump, and no one really know which is which. So <clears throat> they can, in some cases as well, be fine in the front garden, but um, there's the location. The other thing also is about noise. So air conditioning systems were really noisy because they were just very cheap, very cheap and cheerful, and they didn't get looked after much because you only use them for a couple of months in the summer and they quickly were working at like their worst possible operating capacity. Because if you don't look after a system and you just make it work you know, until it breaks, then it's probably going to be working and not in its ideal scenario. So a lot of air conditioning systems people were putting in were not, they first weren't designed to be quiet and then they weren't being looked after. So they were being really noisy. And hence, the planning brought in this whole rules about any kind of thing that's going to make noise. So the rules about noise for planning are quite strict. It's got to be very quiet. The good thing is with the heat pumps is, because they're running through the entire heating season, all the way through the winter, they need to be uh, quiet, because they're going to be a nuisance otherwise. So a lot of the manufacturers have introduced a heavier units that are heavier so there's less vibration, uh, bigger fans that work at a lower speed, so if you have a small fan that's blown really fast, it's going to be noisier than a big fan that's slower. And um, other kind of, they also, most of the heat pumps have um, frequency controlled compressors, so they can actually uh, make the compressor run at a, a slower speed when they need less power. So it's not always running at a fixed speed, it can actually slow down. That also helps to keep it quiet. And... Um, the result of that is that most heat pumps are actually very, very quiet, the kind of good ones. Um, however, if you go to planning, you may still be told to put an acoustic enclosure around the heat pump. So um, that is kind of another thing to think about. You know, if you're looking at the heat pumps, those are the different, different things um, with the, the planning. Uh, and this is the, uh, the MCS process, so if you are within that permitted development, you can, um, you can look at the distance to the nearest habitable room, the nearest neighbour's house, and that will determine if it's going to bother the neighbours or not, if it's going to be a nuisance to them, and all the different factors come into play. So um, I've gone on quite a bit today about heat pumps. Um, there's some nice things that have got energy monitoring, all the systems I install I try to give people energy monitoring, so that you can see how much electricity you're using. If you switch from gas to electricity, you're going to be using a lot of electricity. You want to be able to look at that and check that it's reasonable and you, you know, you're not paying too much. So it's good to have monitoring where you can look at the data, look at the different months and the consumption. Um, we won't talk about any of those things. Um, Dave, did we get any pictures for the solar? Yeah. I was going to talk a little bit about solar, wasn't I? Um, so we also do, I also do, I've worked in solar as well a lot, solar panels. And solar panels are a great thing as well to do in, uh, in London because London is very dry in the UK compared to the, we the West Coast. So uh, Bristol, Manchester will get a lot more rain than we do in London. London, Norfolk, Hull, all this east area is a lot drier. So we get a lot of sunshine. And um, 
the price of solar panels has come down a lot over the last five years, particularly when the uh, war in Russia and Ukraine started, the electricity prices went up. That's improved the payback for solar. So the saving is much greater now as well with solar panels. You're going to save more money if you put them in. And they, um, yeah, so when the Ukraine war started, the UK literally ran out of solar panels. All of the big manufacturers got to the point where they didn't have any solar panels in stock anywhere. You could not buy a solar panel. That's how high the demand surged um, last year. And um, it's now started to kind of go back to normal again. Um, but that was pretty extreme, the growth of the solar PV um, uh, work at that time. So um, it's, uh, there's different systems. I've got some pictures here. This is on a flat roof. So you've got a mounting system. You don't want it to be too angled on a flat roof because the wind loads are very high. And you need a lot of weight to hold it down. We tend not to want to screw into a flat roof because that's a penetration and that's a point of leakage in the future. But there are some systems you can get Nicholson mounts is one system where you can have an integrated, very clever, waterproof seal. So sometimes if a building is very tall and it's very windy, then you might want to pay a bit of extra to make sure it really is fixed so it doesn't have any chance of blowing off. Um, but the low angle is to, again, reduce those wind forces. Um, we've got another picture of... What? What is that? An in-roof system. This is very popular if you're redoing your roof. If you've got a very old roof, you're going to take all the tiles off redo the membrane and put new things on, then you can have an integrated in-roof system. And there are some more pictures of that here as well. So you can see it looks very flush with the tiles, it looks very nice. I think it looks great. And the other good thing is the birds can't go underneath it. So birds, specifically pigeons, are the biggest issue with solar panels um, of all, basically. And the reason is that when people go into solar panels like 10 years ago, there was a big boom in the work that was being done, and people didn't really know about what they were doing. There wasn't that kind of time period of work going on to get that level of kind of tried and tested. And the pigeons loved nesting under the panels. So we can go to an on-roof system here. That small little gap, 100 mil under the panel, is the perfect pigeon nesting point because it's dry, it's warm from the roof, and they can get in and out, they can nest but it's the worst thing for your house because it can block up the drains, it can create leaks, it can cause a fire if the nest is very dry and you've got a short circuit for a not very good connector, that can cause fire. Um, if a solar panel catches on fire, it can be very significant. It can actually burn the entire roof, the entire, everything can burn very significantly. So what, what you need to do if you are in a house and there is a fire on the roof is to isolate the power. They always have a red isolator and you ice it. Once the power is cut off to a solar panel, there's no fuel because the electricity will fuel the fire. Once it starts burning, the electricity from the grid will fuel it to keep going. So the moment you cut that power off, it doesn't have that fuel anymore. And it can obviously keep burning what's flammable, but it won't have that same source. Any question? Yeah, very good question. So, I'll repeat the question. So, what she asked was about um, the asked about the manufacture process of solar panels and also heat pumps as well, saying that they use a lot of unsustainable materials, rare earth materials, and what is the we talk about the embodied energy and uh, the energy in the manufacture of these these goods, these technologies. How does that relate into the savings and the carbon emissions of the technology? And um, in the case of the solar panels, they're basically very similar to TV screens. They're almost the same as an LCD TV, just in reverse. A TV generates light at certain particular wavelengths that we want, and the solar panel absorbs light, again, at exact wavelengths that we, where we want. And so the same as with TVs, with solar panels, we can, we can make them in such good um, scales of economy so you can make so many in such a streamlined way. And the efficiencies that come with that is that even though the manufacturing process is very destructive, does create a lot of emissions, particularly with the resources, um, when you calculate, when you divide up the number of panels you get out of it 
and they're saving from each one, relatively actually, it's quite a low uh, embodied cost. It only takes about two or three years of use to save back the energy that we're using as manufacturer because of this thing of scale of, scale of economy. Um, for the heat pump, you've also got this interesting thing as well about heat pumps because they also use refrigerant gas. And refrigerant gas is actually one of the main um, pollutants in the world in terms of causing global warming because these gases that we talked about earlier are so good at um, boiling and changing states at low temperature, they also trap heat very, very well. So some of the synthetic ones, synthetic ones are 600, 2,000 times more trapping of heat than carbon dioxide. So when the, the heat pump breaks down and when it has a leak and the refrigerant escapes into the atmosphere, it's actually doing damage to global warming. So in uh, tropical countries where there's more air conditioning, it's less regulated, you get a lot more of this uh, release. And maybe you might think of in your cars and vehicles, you have air conditioning in the car. Typically, if you go to the mechanic and you say, it's not working, they say, oh yeah, the refrigerant is, is level too low, I'll just top it up. The mechanic tops up the refrigerant level and it just keeps on leaking. And you use it for a couple of weeks over the summer and then the next year you come back and top up again. And every time you're doing that, you're releasing these harmful refrigerants. In the case of cars now, because the car is quite small air conditioning, they're able to use less damaging refrigerants. Fridges now use it as well, much less damaging uh, refrigerants. But heat pumps are still quite a big level of heat transfer. They still need some of these refrigerants. So um, there are some moves for manufacturers to move over to what's called the natural refrigerants, which is propane, it's a natural gas. That has a much less damaging uh, effect on global warming. And um, they're a little bit limited though as well with how big they can be, how close they can be to, to buildings. They've got some other limitations. Um, but again, similar to with the solar, if you look at the heat pump and the, the refrigerant kind of downsides in comparison to the lifetime saving, it's a small, it's maybe 5%, you know, of the total embodied emissions of that system. Um, so it's still, you know, it's still the right thing to do to be doing heat pumps, even though they have these issues with them. Um, particularly if the heat pump is, um, we looked at some of these systems that are like what we call a monoblock, so it's got all the refrigerant inside the heat pump. Let's just go back. It's a different slide. Oh, is it a different one? Uh, it's okay, no, it's okay. We'll stay on these photos, it's fine. So, um, yeah, it's some of the heat pumps, they don't have very much refrigerant in them, so even if it does escape, it's only two kilograms or less, so not such a, not such a big issue. So, time-wise, time -wise, we're up to be, an hour. It might be good yeah. to um, just have an opportunity for questions, questions. and we've... Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe just a few questions before we move on to, to uh, some refreshments. Um, there is a roving mic, so uh, if you could wait. I've got the roving mic. Um, so I will, uh, if, if you just wait until you've got it, and then ask the question. Yeah, hi, Casper. Do you have experience working with solar tiles? Yeah, solar tiles, good. Solar tiles is basically taking a tile and putting a thin film solar panel on the tile. It's become now to a level where it is available, commercially available. You can buy it for the domestic market. There are people who can do it. The cost of the tile is about 2.5 times more for what you're going to get out of it compared to a normal solar panel. So the economics of it are still a lot more expensive. For a typical house, that costs maybe £6,000 to do normal solar panels you might pay double the price to do it with solar tiles. So it does obviously take down the, you know, the payback, uh, but it's definitely something, there are companies who can do it, you know, it's definitely something that's now available and reliable. Um, I've done a few projects like that, so, um, but yeah, it's much more expensive. Hi. Um, if you were going to retrofit from a gas border to a source heat pump, would you need to completely repump or can you use the existing 15 mil pipe work that goes around the house? If you've got 15 millimeter pipe work everywhere in the house for anything other than a tiny building, it's unlikely to even be good with a gas boiler because a 15 mil pipe can only really heat up three or four radiators and it won't have enough flow to do more than that. And basically when radiators were first going in, people were working at very high temperatures but when you've got a condensing boiler that is more efficient, they only do condensing at heat pump temperatures, at low temperatures. 
So if you run a gas boiler that's condensing and efficient at a high temperature, there's no benefit for the efficiency. It's like having an ancient boiler in terms of the efficiency you're getting out of it. It needs to run at a low temperature. So for low temperature, you need to have bigger radiators and bigger pipework for better flow rates. So generally, if you've got a relatively new house with a new gas boiler and new radiators, then it may well be fine if you've got 22 millimeter pipes and if there's you know, ways you can sometimes you can have pipes in different places, um, then it can be okay. How would you make the judgment between choosing to use solar PV as opposed to solar thermal, given you've only got a limited amount of roof space and, yeah. and money? Good question. So I started doing solar thermal work. I've done a lot of it myself. I know a lot about it. And very sad to stop doing it, basically. But the reality is that solar thermal gives you a saving on hot water only. We can't use solar thermal with space heating because the solar and the heating just doesn't overlap well enough. So it's only for hot water. So the saving from solar thermal is 30, 50, 80 pounds at the best. And the cost of the solar thermal system is four, five thousand times, uh, four, four thousand, five thousand pounds. So there's really no payback with the solar thermal. There used to be government funding. There used to be a two thousand pounds renewable heat incentive. Jeremy was very lucky to have his Green Homes grant that gave even more funding for solar thermal for just a very short window. But without that now, there's no funding now, the payback is just not really there at all. There's no real financial case for it. With the solar PV panels, it's doing both, it's doing electricity, and that electricity is so versatile. You can use it for heating with a heat pump, you can use it for hot water. So there's much better ways you can make use of that electricity. And even if you don't use it, uh, Octopus are paying 15 pence per kilowatt hour for what you export. So you actually can make lots of money off just exporting it. So solar PV now, the economics of it, particularly with the higher gas electricity prices, um, are just very favourable. So I tend, well, I've you know, basically stopped recommending the solar thermal because of the lack of really financial benefit from it. Um, doesn't mean it's not a great technology, amazing efficiencies. Because with a the solar thermal system, you've got heat shining on the panel. You've got a tiny pump that works at a fraction of the power that of energy you're getting. You're looking at 400% or um, 4,000% efficiency with solar thermal because you're getting just loads of free energy. But the, the difficulty is that because it's a plumbed pipework system, it needs quite a lot of expensive components and the saving is sadly quite small. Uh, thank you so much. I've got a question. Um, my wife and I live in a house from 1906, a uh, brick house, yeah. and um, trans uh, transforming it for a uh, heat pump uh, to make it uh, effective for a heat pump is out of the question unless we do major, major work. Um, how about just a top-up heat pump for one room where we sit most of the time, one large room, kitchen, dining? and no tank and minimum of piping, just simple top-up uh, heat pump? So it's a very good question. So the question is basically uh, limited fabric improvements. Is a heat pump still viable? And then you're also asking about if we're doing zoning. So we're not heating the entire house. Zoning is very clever for an uninsulated building because if the building is not well insulated, the question then is do you need to heat every room? You know, or can you just heat the rooms that you're using most? And um, the sad thing, though, is that any system that doesn't, if the heat pump doesn't replace the entire uh, existing system, you won't get that government subsidy, which is significant. £7,500 is significant. So that's the main kind of drawback from only doing a partial improvement. And the reason why they're not allowed, not paying any partial improvements is because in the past, lots of people put heat pumps in as a hybrid system, and the heat pump ended up not doing anything because of the way that they balance the two systems the gas boil ended up just doing all the work. And so it's very hard for them to check that of why the way it's actually where it's configured. And so they decided just to not subsidize us, even though they can be very good. Um, but yeah, in, in, in that situation, putting a heat pump that does just certain rooms, uh, when it comes to the cost of improving a room as well, if you look at room by room and improving rooms, it can be a lot cheaper rather than you know, improving the whole room. And often you'll find that insulating ceilings and stuff can actually make, rooms can be very energy efficient even though the house is not energy efficient. Rooms can also be very airtight as well. You can have very little ventilation coming in, lots of problems with condensation because we haven't got enough 
fresh air coming into rooms that are very airtight, even though your stairwell can be very leaky. You can have loads of air leakage in a stairwell, and then you go into the room, and the room's like completely airtight. So it is important to look in a house at locally what's going on. So for one room, a tank won't be necessary? So if you're looking at um, doing a system that isn't doing hot water, then you'll have to have some other system for hot water. But it's perfectly, there's lots of options. There's loads of options what you can do. Okay, I think um, there are three more questions, but what, what I would suggest uh, maybe is that we move into those questions um, because Casper's very kindly agreed to stay and have a cup of tea with us. Um, and so what we could do is we could bring this part to a close and those three people, uh, I'm sure Casper would be happy to, to be approached um, to, to ask those questions. So I would like to um, say thank you on behalf of all of us for, for Casper for, for coming out this evening and for a really fantastic talk. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to, to put in a plug, uh, two plugs. Next week, um, an energy saving, Mary's holding it up, energy saving evening where um, there are, it's going to be interactive, it's going to be team based, it, you're going to learn a lot, but it's going to be fun as well, and there are ch there's chocolate involved. Um, and, the, uh, and it's here next week. Uh, that's the last talk. The other thing is to encourage all of you, if you're not already members of uh, Muswell Hill Sustainability Group, it is fantastic value. £10 a year for an individual, £12 a year for two people at the same address. Um, I would very strongly, warmly encourage you to um, sign up. Uh, do not delay. And now we have um, some refreshments, so if you want to hang around for a bit and if you have those questions, um, then uh, you're very welcome to do so. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.